Tony Kepfinger. Welcome to Airplay 2020, and a special thanks to Joe Eisen for our new theme music, Watching the Curtain Fall. And that's what we're doing. We're actually behind the scenes of the curtain, and we're going to read a play tonight. It's called Unspoken Acts by yours truly. Reading the parts of the narrator, and all the other parts will be our one and only, Christy Donahue. Reading the part of Father Dale, I mean, uh, Dale, will be um, Timothy Reagan. And reading the part of Father Frank will be Joe Eisen. So without further ado, I give you Unspoken Acts. A disfigured loner befriends a priest who is not able to keep his secret, even though it is told in the sanctity of the confessional. Unspoken Acts. Unspoken Acts is a memory play told by Father Frank, a priest who lives in the shadows of his fear. Set in the present, only he can see the ghosts of the other characters whose lives he has helped to ruin by his then narrow perception. Their voices still echo in his head as he tries to drown out their cries with anything that can numb his pain. Time. The present. Although many of the memories, like most poignant ones, are told as if they are happening in the magic of the forever present moment. Place. The stage is set with a dimly lit spot on the image of a confessional booth center stage. The room is sparse, a bed with one blanket, a small wooden dinner table with one chair, and a desk. On the desk are papers, books, a pen, a bottle with a cork, and a tall glass. Inside the booth, we can see the silhouettes of the penitent and his confessor, a priest. To wisdom be attentive, to knowledge be true that discretion may watch over you and understanding may guard you. The lips of an adroitness drip with honey, smoother than oil. But in the end, lies are as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. And in the end, when your flesh is consumed, you say, well, why did I hate my teacher? My heart scorned love of truth. Why did I not listen? to the voice of innocence. Utter ruin has come, condemned by the public assembly. Lights come up on the confessional, and now we can clearly see the outline of a woman and a priest. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been about six months since my last confession. How long ago was Easter? Uh, well, I know I went for Easter, but but bless me, Father. Uh, I lied to my husband. It, it was about money. I told him that I only paid 20-something for a dress, but it was really 38.99. And I scream at my kids at least once, no, twice a week. I lose it. I, I, I just lose control. My little one looks like a cherub, Father, but let me tell you, she drives me wild. She's three and a half going on 18. My 12-year-old thinks he's 35. Honest to God, Father. I pray every day for patience. My husband doesn't understand. He's loving and understanding, but... Oh, my God, I know. I gossip. I, I talk about other people. Especially my sister-in-law. She tells me all this juicy stuff about her love life, and, well... I'm sure you know people today are out there having their sex out of wedlock. And while my friends and I, I know I shouldn't talk about her, but she makes it too easy. Then she always says she doesn't care what people think. I, I know it's a sin, yet I continue. Oh, Father Frank, I don't want to waste your time anymore. For these and all my sins, I am heartfully sorry. As the priest gives her absolution in Latin, the lights in the confessional dim. The footlights come up slowly. Uh, sacrament of confession was never really my forte. 
In fact, it was always hard for me to look my parishioners in the eyes after knowing what their sins were. I always thought to myself, thank God for the confessional booth. At least we can pretend I didn't know they cheated on their husband, that they beat their kids, that they... And I've always wondered, what if someone confesses to a murder? Now they've started this face-to-face -face method, anything to make it harder on us. Not too many people do it face-to-face. -face. Most people still like to do it in the dark. I guess it adds that sense of mystery to it, keeps that spiritual dimension, and also the obvious anonymity. People think that we're judging when we sentence with three Our Fathers, three Hail Marys, and three Glory Bees. No, we're not judging, or at least I never considered myself to be a judge. There's only one judge, the one. In fact, I never once felt like a judge at all. I could never play the part of Pontius Pilate. To cast my lot in life is to play the character of Judas, the friend who betrayed. I can never forget the first day he came to see me. It was in the confessional. His name was Dale. It was my closest relationship. We grew to be like brothers. Father Frank enters into the confessional. In the shadow, we hear the voice of Dale. Uh, Father, I, I just sort of wandered into your church. I was brought up Catholic, but I ain't been to church since I was a boy. <coughs> oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Um, so you haven't been to the sacraments in uh, a few years? Uh, yep. I didn't really come here to, uh, I mean, I didn't think about church. You know, I mean to. I mean, every now and again, go to church, that is, when I hear the gospel music on the radio. But I look at all them people and all dressed it up like a million. I see myself found, deformed, and I, uh, I just can't get myself out of a truck. Sometimes it is hard. But you're here today, and that's the most important thing. I'm glad you came today. You mean you ain't going to yell at me? <laughs> no, not at all. Oh, boy, I was ready to run the hell. Uh, I mean, the heck's out of here if you were going to start to yell. I get scared when people holler at me. I don't want to be hit. Oh, I'm, I'm just glad you came in for confession. Uh I, I didn't really come for the confession, Father. I, I don't want to lie to you, especially being a, a God man and all. No? Uh, yeah, well, like, like I said before, I, I didn't even mean to come into church. I, I just saw the steeple, the cross from the highway, and, and somebody says in my head, Dale, go in. But to tell you the truth, I didn't really think even something inside me told me to get, get, get myself over there. So here I am. Well, that's good. That's the Holy Spirit guiding you. Oh, you mean like the Holy Ghost? I hmm. always like calling it the Holy Ghost ever since I was a kid. Never thought about him being in me, though. <laughs> I better get going now, Father. I, I feel like getting a little sick gonna throw up or something i ain't used to talking to nobody but I, i've been practicing on the trees and the rivers i talk to the bugs and flowers too will you uh, will you come back tomorrow uh no i can't come back tomorrow i'm hauling a load up steel up north i'm supposed to be at the plant by noon tomorrow i, I got miles to go I gotta go now. This this was nice. Thank you. Thank you kindly. You're welcome. You got any family? Yeah, yeah. A lot of kinfolk. No, no, no. Just one brother left. He he's in a nursing home. He's not well and getting on in years, I guess. How about you? I got one sister. She she went to college and became queen. The college clean. <laughs> yep. 
them northern boys didn't ever see anything quite as pretty till our Darla came to school. <laughs> Boy, she got a milky white eyes as long as the oh, oh, I, I, I'm sorry, Father. Now that's probably a sin right there, huh? Oh, that's why I always stay away from the damn. I, I mean, church. I'm always saying the wrong things. I always goof up with people. Oh, just, just not much of a talker. I like to talk. Don't get much practice. No one stands looking at me. Talking is one of them things where you can't get good unless you do it a lot. And you, and you can't do it unless you're good at it. Like sports. Nobody wants to play with you. I, I'm a, a holler and I don't get to talk much on the road to people. I mean, the driving is long hours and I never got much of a chance to have friends, get a girl, or raise a family. I don't talk too easily. I, I say dumb things like that, and then I don't go back. Besides, I can't expect people to look at me for too long. I look like a pig, pounded by a poker. Just ain't too pretty. But I better go now. Bye-bye. Will you come back again? For the confession part? No, just stop by my church anytime you pass through town. It doesn't have to be during confessions. Come for lunch sometime. Well, why, why should I stop back? You couldn't break with me, Pastor. The likes of me darn sick in a man's stomach. Now, I usually eat in my truck by myself. Well, we could talk again. I'd like that. You would? Sure. I, I don't have many people I can really talk to either. Will you stop back? I do got <laughs> something. <laughs> I'll blow my whistle there for you so you know it's me coming. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. I I'll listen for it. A and I look forward to another talk. I, I do got something to talk to you about. <laughs> he remembered the whistle. It made me smile. I had almost given up on him, thinking I was to blame. I should have been more receptive. You know, for a priest, I am a bit reclusive. Maybe that's why I chose the life in the monastery to begin with. I, well, sometimes I just do not like most people. But I like Dale. He wasn't most people. Most people are pretentious and hurtful. Dale was, he was kind and genuine. His words were simply his words. He didn't come back to me for at least six months. It was odd, but I recognized his voice as if it was only a day. It rang in my head over and over, replaying like a character from an old sitcom. It was the same time again during confessions. I, I was pleased by his visit, yet I acted preoccupied like I didn't really have time to just talk with him. I think it was more because I was dealing with an issue in my own life. You see, a member of my parish asked me to marry her teenage daughter and her boyfriend. The girl was only 16, the boy only 17. The girl was pregnant, almost showing. The boy was a confused adolescent, dealing and abusing drugs. The girl said she stopped when she found out she was pregnant. It was very obvious she had not stopped. The mother and father of the girl attend Mass, only on occasion, but... They do give their offerings regularly. They send their checks in the mail. My pastor said, just perform the ceremony without attracting attention to it. And I had all intentions to do that until they refused to make a confession. Both of the children laughed and said that this confession business was just a joke, and that they didn't need a priest to talk to God, and God could hear them standing under the trees in the park just as well as he could hear them in my silly little phone booth in the church. <laughs> so I told them, go out and ask God to marry them in the park. The young girl also told me that the baby belonged to another boy. She threatened me not to tell a soul. The girl's mother went into an uproar when I refused to marry them in church. Said that priests should be compassionate and that I should be defrocked for my ill temper. Pastor is still distressed and the whole affair blew up in my face. The boy came after me with an axe. We were eating dinner at the rectory. 
bam, 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 he hacked down the door to get at me. His girlfriend had lost the baby. Feel alcohol syndrome. The pastor was afraid for me, and I had to get 16 stitches after the boy cut me with his switchblade. He thought I had cursed her. The mother's now on the parish worship committee. It seems that everyone thinks I should be moved to another parish. The public consensus was growing stronger every day. Page lights fade to black. The sound of a truck revving up is heard in the distance. The whistle blares. The voice of Dale is heard in echo as if it were very far away. I didn't hurt nobody. I mean, I didn't mean to. I was, I was just, well, I was, I was just, Father, can I tell you something? Sometime I need to tell you about this, but not now. The stage light comes up to half. Father Frank is now sitting up in his bed, wrestling with his blanket as he recovers from his nightmare. Shivering from his cold sweats, gets up to get another drink. The, 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 the relocation was up to me, and all I could think about was, what if the truck driver comes back? He, he's so lonely. He's certainly on the verge of something. And just like, just like he said, I, I too can feel the intervention of the Holy Spirit between us. Some people call it animal magnetism. It's an attraction of some kind. Like it's just meant to be. There's definitely a stronghold between the two of us, a, a kind of solemnity, a, a wavelength. I felt it immediately. There's something said in the silence between us. Oh, there was no question. I just had to stay. He came back. Yeah, almost six months to the day. He came to me with a heart just blistering with sorrow and pain, the guilt and confusion festering so that I almost insisted we met face to face, but he was dreadfully afraid of that. He pleaded with me and said that his outward appearance, his face could offend a goat. <laughs> he was truly ashamed. He had asked me, what is a man besides his face? People judge people on face value. They look in your eyes and they decide whether you're a good person or a bad person. He wanted to know why. I didn't have an answer. He wanted to know why God made him so ugly. I didn't have an answer. He wanted to know why people would condemn him on sight. I didn't have an answer. Why are people repulsed by physical deformity? Often in other species it attracts. What possible purpose could his disfigurement play in God's great plan? I didn't have an answer. We grew close together from our talks. He said that I was the first person he had really talked to in 16 years. He was so afraid that I saw him. I recalled my vows, recognized my purpose, and retreated from asking him to meet me face to face. It was just that suddenly I felt so close to him. I wanted to touch his cold, lonely wounds. I just really wanted to make physical contact with him. It was purely a selfish motivation. Perhaps I should have never entered the restrained life. This pitiful soul poured so much pain onto my palate. My mouth was left ablaze. It happened so fast. My mind was in a whirlwind, and it still is. As a man, I feel like I should speak up. I feel as though I need to make a report for justice. But for what? Justice is merely a pastime, and fair resolution is rarely issued. As a man of the cloth, I felt deeply vowed to silence. I just wanted to reach out to his poor soul, to tell him that he will be forgiven after restitution. God, my God, why? He promised to come back, and he left abruptly again. His innocent intentions were more corroded than most people's intention of guilt. Now I could not leave this church, no matter how much ridicule, no matter how many knife wounds. For now, I could sense the divine purpose to my calling. Sudden blackout. The sound of a truck pulling away is heard. The faint whistle blares. We hear the narrator's voice. 
It was only through legislature that I came to know iniquity. I should never have known what depraved desire was unless the courts had spoken it. You shall not covet. Offense seized that moment. It used the commandment to rouse in me every kind of amoral craving. Without law, sin has no life. And at first, I saw truth when I lived without law. Then the commandment came. With it, sin came to life. Sudden silence, then the sound of solitary heart beating, racing. A spotlight comes up to show the silhouettes of a very large man straddling the frail, limp body of a young girl who's being brutally raped. Somebody, please, help, help me, help me, help, help me. Help. He, he, he's hurting me. I, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Daddy, stop. Mama. Daddy, Dale, please help me. Sudden blackout. We hear the narrator. And I die. The commandment that should have led to eternal life has brought me unto death. Stinking death. Rotting death. Deformed life. Sin found its way into my mind. It used the law. First to deceive me. Then to slay my innocence. The law is holy and commandment is holy, just and good. Sudden lights on the confessional, which is now defined to look like adjoining prison cells. The rest of the stage is in shadow. As the lights come up, we see Father Frank enter. He is now dressed in street clothes. He appears to be coming in from the cold as he very slowly removes his hat, scarf, and coat. There are just some things in this life that we mortals cannot cover up, nor should we. As the great Fedor Dostoevsky pointed out, crime is its own punishment. Unscrupulous behavior will never tip the scales of its own mental anguish, even in the name of justice. Still, the question of moral duty comes at least to every man once in his lifetime. Yeah. Yes, yes. We are all cast as judge and jury, accused and accuser. Still, still one must think of the victims. But then again, who isn't a victim? We all are one. Well, I thought I had to confer with pastor. He was my elder. He was wiser. The truck driver and I came to know each other more and more intimately. His confessions became a weekly, sometimes twice weekly occurrence. His name was Dale. I recall writing in my journal that night. Ah, but to gaze upon his pain, to see clearly the degradation of a man of all men, the very face of suffering of all human suffering, but to look deeper, deeper into the true beauty of life, of all great or small things living to look beyond appearance, beyond the illusion, to see the face of God. The sound of the truck pulling up and its whistle blaring shatters the peace of his solitary moment. It startles Father Frank as he jumps from the desk, spilling his drink all over his manuscript. Blackout. Lights up to focus on the prison cells only. Father Frank drops to his knees in prayer and starts to cry. After a moment, we hear Dale, who appears to be crying as well. You're just one of the few people that ain't laughed at my name. People always say things like Dale or Dale or Dale, like Chip and Dale, them, their varmints in the cartoons. And they always laugh. Father, can I tell you something? Sometime I need to tell you about something I had, but not now. Now I'm laughing. <laughs> not not at me, but everything. And, and you know, I, I don't think they is really laughing at my name, but you see, Father, I, I always feel that they is. <laughs> I told myself I wouldn't cry, 
And now I'm laughing. <laughs> it's funny how quickly tears can turn to joy. He wasn't even angry at me. He didn't say that he forgave me. He, he didn't have to. Yep, yep. Everybody always laughed at me. First, because I was dumber than most of them. Even the teacher said so, but then after I got slugged in the face, they laughed at my ugliness. Can't say the blame them either. Better than crying. That's what I used to do. Well, at first. It, it made me smarter, I think. Got my brain fast in, and I think it darn right it made me somewhat smarter. I used to think how man's only got two things in this world. His face and his name. And I always kind of like my name. But I, I guess people get disgusted and talk about my name because of my ugly face. One lady told me I wouldn't be half bad looking if I got my nose put back together. And everyone wondered how it happened. I mean, how my daddy split it all up like this the night of the big thing. It never did heal, right? I can still see my daddy swinging that two by four. Hit me square between the eyes, split my whole head open, wide as a dam. When Mama screamed, he, he belted her, too. Only Darla got away. A good thing she did, too, because she could never stood seeing see Mama all bloody like that. And she ran and got help. I just stood there being my old ugly self. Blood was dripping out of my face, but real slow like and warm. Sort of felt good. Like a big old nosebleed. Yep, I just stood there, being ugly and looking at my mama lying on the floor. I should have stopped him. Uh, I was a big boy for my age, but daddy was bigger. And then he looked at me like I did it. Mama called for me in her silence. I, I could feel her tones for me. He was tolerant too, but I couldn't hear anything. All I could do was stand there looking at my mama lying all bloody on the floor. Her last breath sliding out onto that filthy kitchen floor. I knelt down beside her and put my head on her chest. My blood was mixing with hers. I can remember thinking that. I thought we was going to die there together. She hugged me real tight, like so tight, I couldn't move if I wanted to. That was the last time anybody ever touched me. She whispered, Yeah, your mama loves you. Mama loves you forever. I was the baby. Ten and a half, and still mama's baby. Is your mama still alive, Dale? Nope. She died down there. And your father? Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. Daddy, stop it. Raven Donald is one thing. Uh, you okay, Dale? You can't do like that. Go away. Leave us alone. Don't know. Don't know. Don't know, Mama. Go, go. You're done killing Mama. We'll be okay. Daddy, don't. Mama, no. Stop it. Stop it. No. No, sir. No, sir. I, I don't know. I, I didn't see my daddy doing nothing. I warn you, Daddy, don't hit her. Mama fell. Mama fell. Mama fell. Mama fell. Daddy says Mama fell. Says I fell too. It hit my head. Daddy says Mama fell and hit her head. That's all. P please don't take my daddy away from us. He didn't do nothing. You can't take Daddy. No! Let me go! No, I won't go. No, let me go. I ain't with you. No! I want my Daddy back. Mama! Mama, don't cover her up. She ain't dead. She ain't dead. No! My Daddy! No! Daddy, don't take... Put Mama's dress down. Put her dress down. This ain't right. Daddy, Mama, and Mama, no, go. Mama, Daddy, Daddy, Darla, help me. Let her go. Let him go. Stop them. Let me go. Ugh. Let her go. Daddy didn't do it. Please. Stop. Mama. Somebody. Mama. Sudden blackout. We hear the narrator. Do not, my brothers, speak ill of one another. The one who speaks ill of his brother or judges his brother is speaking against the law. It is the law he judges. 
If, however, you judge the law, you are no observer of the law. You are its judge. The sound of the truck driving away with the faint tune of an old country song fades off in the distance. Lights come up where Father Frank stands at his desk trying to dry off his papers. He drinks from the bottle now that the glass is gone. <sighs> Pastor knew that would be the end of it. The girl's mother left our parish convincing many other upstanding righteous members to go with her. Her husband owned a car dealership in the downtown area. They were what you would call very influential people. She sent a letter of petition to the archbishop explaining how dreadful it was that I convinced her daughter to have an abortion and that her little girl was so confused and dismayed that she tried to abort the child by herself. She drank enough liquor to numb her senses so that she could commit this sin. It almost killed her, too. And all to the credit of unfortunate misguidance by Father Frank Latola, who refused to marry the youngsters. These poor children, it stumbled, but they came to the Holy Catholic Church for compassion, for forgiveness of their sins, and yet they found nothing but contempt. There is but one lawgiver and judge, one who can save and destroy. Who then are you to judge your neighbor? Her letter was truly a composition of personal revenge for me. Pastor told me he'd not let the incident go any further unless I would agree to a reassignment. Reassignment outside the diocese. He knew I wanted to stay because of my brother. I used to visit Clyde every day. He was the only family I had or that I knew of. Well, except for Hank, our supposed stepbrother. Yes, Hank is somewhat of a two-bit criminal. And we, especially Hank, all decided it was best if I really didn't know his whereabouts. When our mother passed, Hank, Clyde, and I went out to a real nice place for dinner. We had a bottle of wine. Clyde told us about his cancer and what he had planned. We knew that we'd never see Hank again. Funny thing, though, I thought it was hilarious when Hank said that he used to go to confession every time he had to slap around one of his girls. He was the proprietor of a house of ill repute on the Lower East Side of the river. I remember laughing and laughing. It was probably the wine, too. Yeah. Clyde didn't think it was funny. He said, just think of that poor priest, how he must have felt. But Clyde and I just laughed. Hank said that it made him feel better if he could dump his garbage out once in a while so he'd go to confession and feel clean again. And that's what he thought the whole religion thing was all about anyway. Just a way to help us deal with our sin. A way to help us measure our pain. Hank said, we all sin. We're all going to sin some more. It's human to sin. I agreed with him to a point, but only to a point. Only to a point. Sudden blackout, we hear the narrator. Whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. Anyone who leads astray one of these little ones shall be drowned by a millstone around his neck in the depths of the sea. What terrible things will come on the world through scandal? It is inevitable that scandal should occur. Nonetheless, woe to that man through whom scandal comes. If your hand or foot is your undoing, cut it off and throw it from you. Sudden blackout. We hear children playing in a schoolyard. Tender voices echo, shouting, laughing, singing lively, joyful songs that suddenly turn to screams of terror. We hear them call out, it's a monster, run, run. As the lights show, a large man enter the schoolyard and pick up a very small little girl. She screams hysterically as he lifts her dress. He begins to squeeze her tightly. He starts to run off with her, then throws her down and vanishes out of sight. Get off my dress, mister, and put me down. Help! You're crushing me! Help! 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 Somebody, please help me! Sudden blackout. We hear the sound of school bells, church bells, 
and police sirens. I'm here, the narrator. Better to enter life maimed or crippled than be thrown with two hands or two feet into endless fire. I'm just wanted to see what was up there. If your eye is your downfall, gouge it out and cast it from you. Sister Anna, somebody, please help me. I just wanted to see it. I didn't hurt her like Daddy hurt Mama and Donna. Please, somebody, I, I can't breathe. I just wanted to help. see. I, I can't. She stopped breathing. Help. I told her to stop yelling. Please, please. I just wanted to see. So I squeezed her to, to stop it. Please. It, it was like, it was me being daddy, and she was Darla and Mama and everybody all over again. So I squeezed her to stop the squealing and screaming. Somebody. And then she stopped, and I dropped her. Mama. And she rolled down the hillside into the highway. I just kept running and running and running, still running from all that. Never was a legal driver, left it all behind until now. It, it's like it, it started chasing me. I guess that's why I came here to view. Sudden blackout. Lights up on the confessional. Inside the booth, we can see the silhouettes of the penitent and his confessor. The stage lights come up to full. It's good to hear your voice again, Dale. You've been on the road a lot? Uh-huh. Yeah, it's been a while. Did you have a nice Christmas? No, I, I tried again to see Darla, but she wouldn't let me see her. Her husband says that they don't want me near their little girl. Uh, I, I guess they'll think I'll scare their kids. Darla thinks I'm dirtier than her. But Darla says to be sure to stay in touch, though, just in case I die before she does. She'll give me a proper Christian burial. She's a real good Christian. So we send the cards once a year at Christmas. Father Frank, can I tell you something? Sometime I need to tell you this, but not now. I spent Christmas in the woods again, alone, halfway between Mississippi. Mm. Now, my holidays weren't exactly great either. Clyde passed away. My older brother. And that's all you had, huh? Yeah. I got nobody, too. I know what that's like. Loneliness it can be a heavy burden. And we see we need to reach out into the family of man. As long as I can help other people through my vocation, through my work, and through our lives, it makes the daily load a little lighter. I guess that's why they say, since we somehow survive. <laughs> hey, you know, we could be like brothers, huh? <laughs> since I ain't got no one and now you got nobody. We seem to get along. I mean, you even sort of seem to like me. <laughs> we could kind of adopt each other, huh? I might even let you see my face. You know, Dale, that would make me very happy. <laughs> Why? It's a wonderful idea. Then we could have somebody to visit at the holidays and stuff. Somebody to see you when you get sick, old and die and all that, huh? Think you could stand looking at my face? You got a strong stomach? Yes, yes, Dale. I'd be honored. This is a really wonderful idea. From now on, I will consider the two of us brothers. True brothers in mind, body, and soul. Oh, I ain't never had a brother. <laughs> Who's going to be the big brother or the little brother? Well... It seems I may be just a little bit older than you, just from the sound of things. <laughs> I'm guessing, though. Should I be the older brother? Yeah, that'd be great. 
I kind of always wanted a big brother. Father, can I tell you something? Well, sometime I need to tell you this, but not now. I'm 24. How old are you? Mm-hmm. Well, yes, Dale. Quite a bit older. I- I'm 42. Well, <laughs> it's all settled then. It-, it seems like it was meant to be. I shall be the big brother. Always wanted a big brother. <laughs> Somebody to talk to. to. My friend Mick used to be like that, but then I found out I, I couldn't trust him no more. It's hard to trust people. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, Dale. He was making fun of me all the time just to get me into trouble and laugh. I thought he was really my friend. It can be hard, Dale. Life is often a struggle. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could just pick out our relatives. Italians do it. <laughs> I knew these Italian people once. They used to do it with whatever they wanted. They acted like they were all related to each other. <laughs> kind of funny, huh? I like Italians. <laughs> They're really some good people. Till they get mad at you. <laughs> then they can be mean as a dingo. <laughs> I'm glad you like Italians, because I'm Italian. Yes, Dale, we can be brothers. Blood brothers. I, I wasn't picking on Italians or anything, Father. I, I just... I, I just, I better get going. I, I'm real sorry, Father. I, I don't like blood, Frank. I, I get scared of blood. Dale, I, I like it when you call me Frank. And since we're brothers. Frank. Okay, Frank. <laughs> I like it very much. Thank you, Dale. Father Frank. Brother Frank. My brother Frank. Oh, I ain't never had a brother. It would be all good if I did, huh? I'm going to tell my boss. Yeah. I'm going to stop up north and visit my brother Frank. <laughs> Only one problem. Nobody will ever believe old Monster Face had a brother that was a priest. Why is it if you ugly like me? If you're the phone? People always think you're bad, too. They always think that that's the evil inside you. But I know a lot of people that are real pretty like and it's real bad. They are downright mean to people. Frank, can I tell you something? Sometimes I feel evil. I mean, I mean, evil you would not believe, Father. Like this one guy, Ronnie. They called him scum. God gave him the whoops like you wouldn't believe. They said the Blessed Mother herself might have fell to cheating with the evil charms and good looks. But you know, he is so rotten inside, like an apple to the core. Woo, he's stinking rotten. He fools everyone with his devilish grin. Not me. I saw him once outside the Circle B truck stop. The bathroom was out of order and the other was full and I had to tap a kidney and I just couldn't wait. So I went out back a ways into the woods and damn, sure enough, he had a little baby bird in his hand. In one hand. And he was squeezing the life right out of it. And he was laughing. Just laughing like this. <laughs> yeah, and the poor little thing was squealing for its mama, but he just kept on squeezing it still. Uh, appearances can be deceiving, Dale. Trust is a gift from God. We have to look for it in other people. We have to seek it out. Wait till I tell them guys at the plant and at the truck stop. <laughs> I might even be able to talk to them guys now that I got something to say. Well, I'll, I'll practice on the trees some more. <laughs> yeah, Dale, practice on the trees. <laughs> Someone to talk about. And they can't laugh because you're a priest. <laughs> They'll think I'm more related to God now. Is it a lie to tell them we're brothers? No, no, Dale. It, in God's eyes, we're all brothers and sisters. <laughs> yeah, because I can't lie to God, especially after I, what I've done. I, I can't lie to God if I expect him to forgive me. Do, do you really want to be my brother? Yes, yes, Dale. And I meant it when I said that I enjoy our conversations. I really do look forward to our talks, honestly. And Dale, sometimes 
we think we're responsible for someone else's actions. Thanks, Father. I mean, Frank, you don't even know what you've been doing for me. Why, well, talking to you let off that pressure in me. Then ghosts quite chasing me? I get this hot feeling like my belly's gonna start working up vomit or something. Like I do when them ladies in the truck stops look at me. So can I tell you something? Sometimes I, I, I remember things uh, and sometimes it's like a dream, a nightmare. And, and I did something very, very bad. Don't Don't be so hard on yourself. Whatever it was, just know you did the best thing you could at the time. We all walk in darkness until we see the light. What is that in the road? You're afraid. You see it as a snake. I shine the light on it, and now we can both see that it's just a stick. Yeah, you were just a boy when that happened to your mother. You're not guilty for that sin. You're not guilty at all. So come back to see me anytime, Dale. I like talking with you. My brother. People stare at me, and I get a, a scared. All I was doing is trying to get some breakfast, and they stare at my face like I just raped their daughters or something. Frank, can I, t- I tell you something? Sometimes I wonder why is it such a, a sin to be so ugly? I, th- I think it makes me do ugly things. It's not a sin to be ugly, Dale. It's not. Not at all. Not at all. And, and you're not ugly. Not at all. I'm sorry. I- I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We. Sudden blackout. Sound of children playing fades out. Lights up on the table. There is bread broken in the basket. And a glass of wine is poured. Frank imagines filling another glass and speaks for Dale as if he were there now, except this time. He does it with rapid fire delivery just to work it out of his memory. Next month is Easter. Uh huh. I like Easter, Billy. Would you like to join me at my Easter dinner here at the parish house? I usually cook the goose myself. No. Well, I haven't had dinner with anyone since I was a little boy. Good, then I'll expect to see you Easter Sunday in the rectory. Oh, maybe I'll come in time for my <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Great. Yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll sit right up front. Then you can get used to looking at the old monster face before it's time to eat. I'll sit in the front, Frank. You know what they call Easter on the gospel station on the radio? They call it the Day of Reckoning. <laughs> I can't wait to see you. I know you won't even mind my face, will you, Frank? Dale, you're my brother. I will not judge you, and that's a promise. Can I take communion on Easter? If you let me hear your confession. You won't tell nobody. I'm sworn. Then let's go to confession now. Right now? Yes. Okay. Sudden blackout. Harsh electronic melters. Music filters in as the sound of several large doors closing. Prison cells are being locked one after another. Guards shouting. The sounds of men fighting, cursing, banging on the metal bars, and more doors locking. And sudden silence. Let me hear the narrator. The faithful are gone from the earth. Among men, the upright are no more. They all lie and wait to shed blood. Each one ensnares the other. Their hands succeed at evil. The prince makes demands. The judge is had for a price. The great man speaks as he pleases. The best of them is like a brick. The most upright like a thorn hedge. Lights up on Father Frank who lies struggling with his blanket. He's being tormented by his nightmares again. The sounds of a courtroom out of order are silenced by a judge pounding his gavel repeatedly. Father Frank jumps to his feet, rushes to the desk, 
and reads aloud. The day announced by your watchman, your punishment has come. Now is the time of your confusion. His life was his punishment. Have mercy on this boy. He needs your help. The sounds of a rowdy courtroom resume. Some people are screaming for justice, while others are calling out for mercy. Order! 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 I demand order in this courtroom immediately. Have mercy on this boy. Have, have compassion. The sentence here has been set. Dale, you will receive the death penalty. You cannot use my testimony. The sentence here has been set. Order! Order! I demand order in this courtroom immediately. You, back to your seat. Now! Clerk, cuff him. I, I will not be silenced. This is not the whole truth. Just let me speak for him. You preach back to your seat now. This is not the whole truth. Let me speak for him. Clergy are not above this court. Please, please, I beg you. In your seat, Father, now. Please, please, this is all my fault. Pastor Jones was not... Cuff him. This is my fault. Please let me speak for him. Clerk. Cuff him, get him out of my sight. Please. For his crime against humanity, in particular the brutal death of little Amy Lou Williams, an innocent young girl. This court of law of the state of Mississippi hereby sentences you, Dale Delaney, to the death penalty. Sudden blackout. The courtroom erupts in tumultuous shouting. Justice and mercy echo through the roar of the crowd that is backed up by a chanting chorus. There is sudden silence as a pin spot opens to Father Frank, who is kneeling center stage. That was Dale's last confession, but it was not mine. I will soon leave this church, and I will confess to the world about the lies we face each day in these institutions. We are, in fact, our brother's keeper. We need to show compassion. For it's in them that we come to know our own mercy. We are them. God's love, God's mercy is for all of us. Please, God, let me speak for this boy. A mistake that he made a long time ago, a, a really bad mistake, but it was the first time he had ever had booze, and those men there taunted and teased him. It was his 22nd birthday. He had never been drunk before. The truckers got him drunk. They took him to the schoolyard and they told him to pick up a girl. So he picked up a little girl. The truckers put him up to it. He didn't mean it. He's, he's like a little boy. Like, just like a boy. I told him to confess. I told him to come to you. He trusted me. God. Where is the mercy in the mind of men? And the lights fade to blackout. 